Hi and welcome everyone to the CAA show. CAA, as all of you know, is Conversations and Analysis and my name is Jaggi Basin. To wear or not to wear the hijab in schools, that is the question and the controversy of our times and it is not dying out any soon. In fact, it is spreading like wildfire. So much has been said and written about it. And yet, there is a need to hear voices of moderation and maturity on this issue. And I can't think of anyone better than two personalities to speak with authority on this issue. Retired Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah is a distinguished soldier and a gentleman. Plus, he is an eminent educationist to boot. He is a former Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University and currently he is the President of the Sir Sayed Education Foundation for Children. He helps the foundation to establish modern secular schools for children of marginalized families. So, in a way, he is the perfect person to talk of the current controversy. His daughter, Saira Shah Halim, is a well-known television personality, a brand consultant, speaker and a writer of note. She always has a mind of her own on issues of social and political relevance. And if I dare say, she minces no words. And plus, on a personal note, she's a good friend of mine. So welcome to the program, General Shah and Saira. And straight off the bat, General Shah, this is the first question which I'd like to address you. You are both, General Shah, a military man and an educationist. Now, is this issue at one level simply about school discipline or now it has become a much bigger issue which has religious identity and patriarchal issue connotations because if I may say of vested interest. What is your viewpoint sir on this? Uh, thank you for this conversation Mr. Basi. Uh, I look forward to it. Uh, at the start let me tell you that it is a diversionary tactics. It is diversionary, it is a non-issue, and should not have been played up to this extent. Why? Because it has uh, well affected India's standing and reputation in the community of nations. India's secularism, its plurality, its diversity of cultures, it's a multicultural, multi-ethnic nation, this was celebrated all over the world. Now, unfortunately, what has happened? It has invited diverse comments from a large number of countries, which should not have happened. I mean, this is India's affair. But the world has now become a village. And you can't avoid issues at home being discussed and being criticized worldwide. So this thing has certainly impacted India's reputation uh, as a forward-looking nation which accepted all religions, we do still accept. But as I say again, this is a non-issue and is adversely affecting our reputation, which was, well, wonderful all over the world. Mm. Correct. No, I, I completely take your point, General Sir, uh, that uh, this issue has not only uh, become overblown, but it has spread beyond anyone could even in their wildest imagination think so but the fact is it's there right now it's in a very inflated and an expanded manner all around us and we are have to live with it so we have to confront it also sarah if i can just uh, switch to you then i'll come back to general sir a little later uh sarah for me you actually in a sense you know you define modernism uh i know i in fact i would even hesitate to say that you have a Muslim identity, which you have obviously, but that's only a small part of your identity because I know you as a person, you have so many different roles you play and with aplomb and uh, with uh, so successfully also, you are so much more than that. Uh, and I also know that you basically are a liberal at heart. But I still get the sense, Ira, and I can't escape the sense that this entire controversy also is to me a showcasing of a failure of liberal values because somewhere along the back of uh, this controversy, whatever anyone might say, but there, it is like a return to orthodoxy and to a certain extent of patriarchy also. What do you think about that? 
Uh, see, uh, Jaggi, it's basically whether women in India decide, choose, uh, you know, to wear the hijab, that is exercising the agency, or whether it's women in Afghanistan, I- Iran, or Pakistan, or whichever country, who are fighting against this concept. So I stand with agency and I stand with personal choices to clothing. Now, what really doesn't matter is what is on your head. It can be a turban, it can be a hijab. What matters is what's inside the head. So here, I think it is completely discriminatory when you you know, bully women into submission and use majoritarian tactics to stop them from educating themselves. You know, Because firstly, primarily, let me iterate. That it is very challenging, forget Muslim women, it's very challenging for women in India, especially the rural belt, belt to come to schools and get themselves educated. You know what happens during the periods, they do, there are no proper toilets, uh, then there are a whole lot of other issues that women have to grapple with. Now, coming with the Muslim community, uh, Islam always, if you start, the first word, word starts with read, you know, learn. So they've really emphasized a lot on education for women. In fact, our prophet Muhammad also, he said that blessed is the woman whose first child is a woman, whose first child is is a girl. So there's been a strong condemnation of infanticide. There's been a strong condemnation of uh, this whole apartheid system, you know, where men, women, uh, you know, where women's role is lower than women. So women's role role is lower than men. Mm. So here, what is happening is uh, it's nothing, you know, Jaggi. It's just minority baiting, and harassing women is a part of the minority baiting that is going on. You know, if you've seen recently, it happened with the uh, Sully deals mm-hmm. a year and a half ago. There was no reprimand. There was absolutely, uh, you know, no enforcement agencies that took action on that. Now, that has snowballed into the bully app. So now today, women are being sold on auction on the internet. It is nothing but trying to intimidate a community which is all which has already been, you know, kind of being bullied. And uh, they're being left rudderless. Look at their representation. Look at their electoral representation. Look at uh, the online harassment that's being sub- subjected to in other ways, the community is being made to uh, understand that you are no longer uh, an equal citizen, you no longer enjoy equity, you are a second class citizen. So that is not just an insinuation, it is being directly being shoved into people's throat and you know is being kind of m- being made to understand that you need to relegate now in the background so it's unfortunate it's happening yeah it's unfortunate yeah. that people are being reduced to the immediate identity and as you said that a person is much more than the immediate identities so it's tragic sure. that it is happening and uh, they, they, there are no words to say about i, I, hear you, I, I and uh, I, I actually will take a lot of your words seriously also because willy lady you are now becoming as one of the spokespersons of the community so uh, and then maybe there are there are a lot of points which you have raised but uh, let's let's talk of one particular issue which is i think very relevant out here and that's the question of free choice um, and i will again go back to general uh, general sahab uh, general shah you besides being uh, such a distinguished army man you're also a very well known educationist you know that is again your area of expertise and obviously you have dealt with the uh, schools and colleges now in school we have the sense you know we uh, that their school is like a safe space where we kids live their lives and identity and religious issues are not really important there they obviously will come later when you go to college and higher education but that's a time when literally practically everyone is equal uh, therefore from that point of view uh, and and also the fact that in schools you have everything which is has a certain discipline you have class periods you have homework you have you know everything has to follow to a certain protocol now supposing if this rule is skipped and i take saira's points she has very valid points which she just enunciated for all of us 
But if we're supposing we break this particular rule, then uh, there is no stopping the breakage of other rules also. How will that happen in the school space? That's my question to you. Okay, let me explain what happened in uh, Karnatak. Uh, there was uniform specified for government schools. Nothing was mentioned about head covering. There was religious symbolism. Sikhs were allowed to wear turbans. People were allowed to have caste marks. And I think that if a rule had to be made, there should be rules. I mean, discipline is absolutely essential, in, especially in schools, yeah. where, uni where the prescribed uniform must be worn. But that must be specified and spelt out in the beginning of the term. You can't suddenly in the middle of a term start saying or can't start objecting to a person who has been wearing a, a, a hijab from the beginning of the term. That implies that there are obviously some pressures which have brought to been brought to bear, which have made you give that diktat that no hijab is to be worn. Now, as I said, uh, the, it is a matter of free choice, provided it does not violate the, the discipline of the uniform. Now, let me tell you that the uniform is worn by the US military, by the British military, by the Canadian police. They, I mean, they are sticklers for uniform, but what have they done? to keep the sentiments of the religious members. They have allowed the hijab in the color of the military uniform. Nobody has any problems with that. I would say the same thing must apply. The students should be permitted if they feel it's a matter of choice. My family does not uh, wear hijab or burqa, but I personally feel it's a matter of personal choice and wearing a hijab which is consistent with the school uniform, the same color, I don't think violates any form of discipline. I've already explained mm -hmm. where this has been accepted in militaries which are very, very sticklers for discipline. But my last word is discipline is the last word. We need discipline and why are school uniforms so important? Mm -hmm. School uniforms are important to eliminate. I mean, somebody coming in Nikes, somebody coming in chapels, you know, these are things which stand out. And this is what, when school uniform was introduced in my school, St. Joseph's College, That's right. the principal explained it to us. Mm -hmm. That means everybody is on the same footing. They wear the same standard of clothes. They wear the, you know, you don't wear fancy stuff. So uniform is a must, but give freedom of choice where some of the girl students feel that their religion dictates the wearing of a hijab. No, uh, uh, very well spoken, General Saab. Uh, I take your points completely. In fact, uh, if I can share my own experience, I was educated in a missionary school and I remember the boys who were, who were Christian in our class, they used to go for catechism, you know, and there used to be a church next to the school. Uh, that's all we knew because I, I I don't recall anyone at that time you know we were aware oh we are Muslim or Hindus or Sikhs or Christians or whatever there was a sense of that you know we we're all competing fighting and uh, kind of being together so therefore maybe this problem has really got overblown do you think at another level a simple cooling of heads and sensible people like you probably would have if the schools had invited uh, maybe people like you and a kind of a via media because you mentioned something very interesting you said that the uh, the hijab has to be consistent with the school uniform it has to be appropriate with the school uniform so do you think maybe this could not have escalated to this level if only some eminent people from different communities had been brought in in the first place and the issue had been sorted out there itself See, unfortunately, it has got politicized. It has got politicized. This, yeah. is, a, this is an issue hmm. which should have been resolved between the parents and the school administration. Yeah. But what has happened is they've been bullied, the, the principals, 
into, uh, I would term it a strong word, cultural fascism. Okay. They, have, they have succumbed to that and they should not have. You know, this is a thing which is, uh, as I said, a matter of personal issue. This matter could have easily been resolved between parents and the school committees. It has been overblown and I think it needs to be put to rest. Put to rest. Okay. But but the fact is, right now we are facing now, it, it's huge. It has assumed very dangerous and gargantuan proportions, I would say. So, Sarah, let me come to you and my question to you is this. And let's... Now let's confront uh, the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the politics, the political aspect of this entire thing. Um, so for the benefit of our viewers, I like to say, and a lot of people would be aware that Saira, you do come from a leftist background. But your, I know your leftist background is a gentle, liberal kind of an ide ideology. Now the fact is, what we are witnessing out here, that's what reports are saying, I, I haven't fact-checked on the ground, that uh, there is something called the PFI and the Campus Front of India, which is supposed to be behind the girls. And uh, these organizations uh, have a certain radical edge to them, and there has been a little bit of radicalism, or quite a lot of it actually in the southern states. My question to you, Saira, would be that, would you be comfortable that of this association of the PFI and all these other organizations, what General Saab is saying makes so much of sense to me that if cooler, sensible, mature heads had nipped the problem in the bud at the school level, this problem would have been solved. But the fact is now we have, and, and, and I'm sure there are radical organizations from the other end also. I'm not saying it's only one side. Uh, there could be saffron uh, entities also which are provoking the students from the other end. But the fact is, we live in a political world and there are these political hardline organizations which are now backing the students. What would you say to that? No, I agree with you, Jackie. They are uh, right-wing forces from both sides of the community and they kind of uh, feed each other, which is unfortunate. So, but what is uh, actually happening is uh, this particular incident has been orchestrated you know, for, to reap political dividends. We know that a few states are up for elections in the next coming months. And this issue has become such a pressing, pertinent national issues that all other issues of corruption and uh, the pandemic and so many other important issues have been uh, completely, uh, what do you call, uh, cancelled because this has become like a national calamity. It is not. It was a handful of girls who were made to stand out, which started in 2021, as I read up on the case. It was not about uh, what happened, what triggered uh, two months ago. So there were these three, four girls who were in Udipi who were made to stand out of the classroom because they were wearing a hijab. So uh, tell me, if this particular incident happens with a Sikh student, do you think people, uh, do you think the community will tolerate this? Because Turban is a part of the identity, the kara, the turban. No, it might be religious markers, but it is uh, what you call inherent. It is uh, important and vital for their identity. Now, the interesting part is that in Islam, nobody talks about the hijab. Yes, what they have talked about is the jiljab, or they've talked about the, um, they've talked about a, uh, covering, you know, like a visual covering, which ordains to men and women both. Mm -hmm. So the book says, all ye believing men and women, lower your gaze, you know, when oh, you, okay. Okay. yeah, it tells, so it's the parda is not meant just for women also. It tells men to be modest as well. Okay. That when you're in the company of women who is not your spouse or your sister or your daughter or mm -hmm. your mother, Okay, you're supposed to be lowering your gaze and practice modesty. Mm -hmm. So this implication is not just for women in Islam, it is for believers in Islam. It is for men as well. Mm -hmm. That's because here, you know, there can be a lot of uh, connotations and, uh, you know, what do you call, uh, different kind of interpretations or, on the passages, on the verses. Correct. So Islam emphasizes on modest dressing. Yes, which is a fact. But nowhere does it say that you need to uh, practice hijab. Now, hijab is a cultural identity more than a religious identity. So if, we, if it has become a cultural identity, you know, wherein people, if you look at uh, the television channels, when they, uh, you know, what do you call, portray 
a, a Muslim individual, it is always stereotyped because it's 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 been a part of cultural stereotype. No. They rarely show women like me who are liberal and who wear Western clothes and who are working and who are, you know, they will show women in a hijab. They will show Muslim men in a skull, skull cap. Skull cap yeah. So this is appropriation of the, you know, what do you call misappropriation, I would say, uh, in the cultural context. Okay. But and a Muslim me, Kara, is, You mentioned, is, no, I'll just, uh, let's step a little back because you mentioned some very interesting things. So I'll just go over them one by one with you. First thing you were mentioning about the Sikhs, by the way, I don't know, uh, you know what this general sub certainly wouldn't, but I'm a Sikh by the way, and I used to actually wear a turban in school. Uh, so you know, we yeah, have I know the concept about of the, <laughs> you know, I think you know about this. So we have the concept of the five Ks, you know, but the fact is, yeah. honestly, I have never known a Sikh boy who has ever carried a kirpan to school. It's not possible. So, but it's pa part of the five uh, it's part Ks, of the five Ks yeah. but the fact is, so right from childhood, you are in violation as it is of the sacred principles. So it's never really that you can, in in in, uh, in modern times, you can go along with that. It's not possible. That's the first point. Uh, the other points which you have mentioned that it has, that the hijab, because if I'm not mistaken, and uh, General Saab will bear me out, uh, uh, there is obviously, and you've absolutely mentioned it correct, though I, I haven't certainly gone through the Quran, but I don't think it's a religious, it's a part of the religious text. I think it is a recent import from West Asia because of the sandstorm problem. And, you know, they were encouraged to wear a kind of a veil, uh, kind of a covering to actually cover the head, the ears and everything from, uh, and then slowly it has become a cultural, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it is more of a cultural thing today. So in that context, and you mentioned this and you have explained this uh, so very well. My question to you in this point is, supposing if this was, let's say, assuming not a BJP government at Karnataka, I am um, I am saying because in Kerala also and in Maharashtra they have mandated you can't wear the hijab. I am saying could not a sense have been there that stop all cultural appropriation, whether it is not only Muslims, whether it is Sikhs, whether it is a Hindus also, uh, including uh, saffron, uh, you know, tilaks and everything. Stop all that when you enter school. Would you be comfortable with that? See, if you've seen what is happening, uh, uh, this case of Muskan, which has kind of uh, gone viral, this particular picture, she parked her vehicle in the parking lot and she was coming to her class, right? Yeah. Now, these group of, uh, you know, hooligans were not from the college. Sure. They were from, a, uh, you know, they were from outside and apparently backed by a political organization, a right-wing organization. So all these men who bullied Muskan were given brand new saffron scarves of the same sh shape, size, color. So definitely there is a political backing to this issue wherein some people feel they're going to reap political dividends. And uh, you know what happened in uh, Nazi Germany? Uh, they were, you know, what do you call, not allowed to enter the University of Vienna mm -hmm. in 1938 because they, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So if you see what is happening is history is repeating itself. Firstly, it is always this noise about uh, namaz space in Gurgaon, if you've seen, then it becomes about the azan, then it becomes about sully deal, uh, you know, uh, and uh, bully app, right? Now it's come to women in hijab. Yeah. So I think this whole big talk about uh, liberating Muslim women and abolishing the triple talaq was just, uh, you know, uh, what do you call an eye wash. Because if you really care for Muslim women, as you say, you would let them exercise their choice. And like I said earlier, it's, it's anyway a challenge for Muslim girls to come out and get themselves educated. Right. So why would you kind of build so many impediments on them that, you know, bully, bully them, harass them, and uh, what do you call, embarrass them, where even teachers are being asked to, you know, disrobe themselves in front of the varsity and enter. So what will happen is, economically, who is going to suffer? Economically, if people start losing jobs right. because you choose to wear the hijab. So it is essentially the woman 
the the Muslim from a minority community who would suffer if she doesn't get uh, a job because she is disempowered. At I'm least talk, if I'm she is going to talk, talk of this is a very important point which you raised about the job thing, but I'm going to talk about that. Sarah, let me go to General Saab. This is a, a couple of interesting points. Um, General Saab, you are an educationist also because that's a very important role which you are playing right now. And obviously you interact with a lot of schools and uh, teachers and certainly students also. Uh, a lot of them, as you said, from the deprived sections also. Uh, Personally, I see a contradiction here because you are a very modern family, you know, and as Sarah explained that, uh, uh, you know, you, you uh, I mean, you, you don't have the hijab or the burqa in the house, uh, but you obviously understand the Islamic tenets very, very well. How do modern families, Muslim families like you then explain these contradictions? And let's step away, away from the controversy because there is another aspect to it that this is also an issue about education of uh, Muslim kids, especially from economically deprived sections. Now, how do you explain this contradiction to, the, uh, to them in terms of this controversy that should you wear the hijab, should you not wear it when you're coming to schools? How do you handle this problem at the, at the school and the college level then? What is your approach out there? See, I, uh, one of our methods is direct interaction between the parents of our students. And uh, a very pertinent question was asked by the press of non-Muslim students attending our schools. The press asked them, why are you studying? Well, they said, uh, the parents said, it is the best school in the district. Mm -hmm. Now, interacting with parents uh, opened my eyes. I was trying to convince them that, look, of course, I, I said it's your personal choice, but it is a matter of interpretation. It's how you, you know, the Quran uh, mentions hijab in very, very uh, broad terms. Okay. It is really the hadith, that means the sayings and traditions of the Prophet, mm -hmm. which clarifies that the head covering is to be used. Okay. This again, between various sects, is a matter of interpretation and we explain to them it's you do what you interpret but they gave me a very pertinent uh, thought they said general sir if people go around naked the society doesn't object hmm. now i have been uh, uh, the ensuring security at the kummela okay. in in um, it was in the year i was commanding the regiment in allahabad right and you had these naked hordes of them, people running. Nobody objected. I mean, I didn't object. None of the women there objected. Yeah. It was the personal choice of the sadhus. That's right. And we should respect it. Mm -hmm. So they tell me if people can accept that, what is the problem of accepting the hijab also? And I thought it made some sense. And I left it at that. And, and I told them it's a personal choice. My attempt always, when I was in Aligarh Muslim University, is to make my wife and my daughters meet the students, student body. Wherever I went, I took them along because I wanted them to convey a message that it is a matter of choice. It's a matter. You wear what you like. And I'll give you what happened. You know, we were running a course called the Bridge Course. Okay. That is the transition from the madrasa into modern education. This was something which which is which Aligarh Muslim University is tasked to look after the cultural and educational advancement of Muslims of India. Yeah. And we have a hundred of these madrasa students who do a crash course of one year into modern education. Twenty-five of them are girls. Now, the first time when I go into the course, I find the black burkhas. I find the facial veils, which are not mandated in Islam at all. Right. The burqa is not mandated. It only says dress modestly. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought the burqa was yes, mandated, yes. not the hijab. No, no, no. Burqa, burqa is not mandated. Okay. okay. Burqa is not mandated. The face covering is not mandated. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. When we explained this to them, after a week when I went back to the bridge course, 
there was very little evidence of burkas. Okay. Yes, the head covering was there, the hijab, but not the facial covering. So wow. it is uh, for people to put across uh, their views, but don't try and fight it. Say, no, no, you've got to wear it. My position is if somebody imposes something, fight it. Okay. If somebody tells you or try to impose on you, don't wear the hijab, fight that too. Got so it. imposition of any type, I think is against the basic grain, the basic ethos of India, which is a multi-religious, multicultural country. Right. Uh, General sir, we are actually really coming to the end of this program, but there's uh, something very interesting I would like to know from both of you in short answers. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the reason also why uh, all three of us are talking together, because this is a very interesting thing. You are like two generations, Saira and Saira is obviously the younger generation and older generation. Regarding this controversy, do you, there would be obviously a lot of points of convergence, but is there a point of diversion which you feel with Saira, for instance? And that would also explain what the, probably the older generation is thinking of this issue and what the younger generation is thinking. Would you like to expand on that and I'll ask Saira, Saira the same question? No, I don't think there's any difference of view between okay. the older and the younger generation. Saira okay. and I have, have okay. uh, talked very often on this. Of course, she is more of a liberal than I am. Okay. Uh, I'm a little little conservative, but having been having been uh, spent 44 years, four years in training and 40 years in the army, in a great organization, which saw your intrinsic worth right. and allowed you to do what you like, provided you remain within the bounds. Within the that bounds. That is very important. You've got to remain within the bounds. So I don't think that exceeding the wearing of the hijab, if permitted by all over the world now, okay. uh, in, in militaries which have stood for by discipline, I feel that the wire media is to drop the issue, allow the girls if they're, if they're conscious. Now, let me tell you, a lot of girls who did not wear the hijab are now suddenly wearing it. That's right. Because they feel they must stand by their sisters. It has snowballed into a problem where none existed. I this, whole matter, this whole matter can end in case there's an amicable settlement between the parents and the girls. Right. If some of the girls strongly feel that they need to wear the hijab, okay. let them wear it. No face covering. That is not mandated in Islam at all. It's a wrong notion which people have. I repeat again, burqa and face covering, not mandated. The hadith, which is the sayings and traditions of the Prophet, do mandate that the hair should be covered. In case, there are two solutions. In case the chunni which the girls wear can be used as the head covering. What's the problem? It covers the head and the breast. And if the dupatta or the hijab Conforms to school uniform, I think the matter will end. Uh, wise words, uh, General Saab, I think we'll have to wrap it up because I think we're completely running out of time. Saira, last quick word from you. Any other solutions besides what General Saab has suggested? Would you like to add anything more or any point of divergence which you have from your father? See, all I like to say is that, you know, this whole talk and jingoism about one faith, one attire, one language, language imposition, cultural imposition, it is wrong. For a country like India, which is so diversified and so huge, the, you, you cannot be uniform. And uniform, I understand, you know, I've studied in a Christian missionary, you know, I've studied in a boarding school with strong Christian ethos as well, where Muslim girls from conservative families used to wear a uh, shalwar, instead of socks, okay? And they used to wear the hijab. So if the Christian missionaries could allow this, I really don't understand what this brouhaha is all about. It's, I think, basically a non-issue, which could have easily been resolved between the parents and the varsity administration. It shouldn't have snowballed into a political issue. It should not have snowballed. It should not have snowballed. Right. But the fact is, we are right now in the thick of it, and hopefully uh, sensible words uh, uh, of Saira and General uh, Saab will probably prevail in the end and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll step back from the ring. Thank you so much both of you for sharing so your much. thoughts and uh, uh, General Saab once again uh, pleasure to have interacted with you I've interacted with Saira of course before and 
let's hope this view is now carried across to a lot many more people and uh, cooler heads and uh, tempers are you know they come down on this particular issue thank you so thank much. You very much thank you so much thank you to the president jain jain sir thank, thank you so, so much for thank joining you. thank you yeah thank you for having us over thank you